way here today. I'm coming through the airport. I uh, almost had me an attitude. I was asked two stupid questions. One by a brother, I thought. And one by a white dude. White dude asked me, was I born again Christian? I really get attitude behind that. And before I could really deal with that, the brother walked up. I try to be regular, you know, I it's the black carpets, I wear my tux if I'm going through the ghettos. <laughs> it don't work sometimes. I went through the ghetto one day and I said, put them both up, nigga, this is stick up. <laughs> Up until 60, my biggest problem in America was physical. I had to physically watch out for my life, my family's life, and the whole thing. Now it's mental and economics. And the whole groove got to change now. We got to move it to another level, this economic level. It means now that we got to start telling our children and our loved ones about entrepreneurship. I mean, it's, you know, let, let me give you this example. If we found out that the Jews in the late 40s and early 50s was sending their children to college so they can come back and work for the Nazis. We would say the Jews was crazy because we know how the Nazis felt about them. But yet in America, we can send our children to school, the best schools in the whole world, to come back and work for Fortune 500 companies that feel the same way about us Nazis felt about Jews. Now, until that day change, until I have to have enough respect for myself not to work my butt off and my wife work her butt off to send our black children to colleges all over the world to come back to work for racist white companies that wouldn't give their mama and daddy or me the time of the day. How do you get around it? We black folk did $688 billion cash last year. There's not a single white group in America that has this economic power. 36% of every Cadillac sold last year, black folk bought them. We can put General Motors out of business. We spent $2.5 billion with Coca-Cola last year. We ain't even made them get out of South Africa. We drink Coca-Cola and don't even taste the blood in it until we change the priorities. When Bush vetoed the Civil Rights Bill last year, we should have said, no Christmas, sis, and Roebuck would get that sis right before, because all at once, when this little narrow-headed dude in the White House do something that's going to affect Sears and Roebuck's profit level because they made me mad. Then when we do this, then I can drop my hostility. I'm not mad at you, man. I'm mad at a white racist system. I'm not mad at white folks. I'm mad at a white racist system. But I know I better not talk nasty to white folks. I know I better not cut my eyes at one of them, but I can do anything I want to do to you. This is why our hostility rate. And see, any way you cut it, your agenda may be holy, and let me tell you, what we black folks is trying to prove, that is a holy agenda, but hatred will burn up your hope. And a system that you make like it's better than it is, a system that you try to go along with just so you can pay your rent makes you so hateful. And if you just look, especially black men, look at the looks on their faces. Most of them walk down the street with some old evil look on their face 24 hours a day, they're not mad at me. They will kill me, not because they're mad at me. They're mad at a system, women of all races understand this. Their husband can be mad at something on the job and they'll come home and knock their old lady down. Why? Because I can hit you and get away with it. I'm not even aware I'm doing it because I can get away with it. I'm relieving some tension. And so consequently, when we look and move this thing to the mind level, move it upstairs to a whole different level, then we will change the whole thing because we can change it overnight. Once we understand that the problem is a white racist system wrapped into this sexist mentality of mine, and I believe that I'm supposed to defend for my wife, and the system won't let me do that. So I go see how much whiskey I can drink. And I keep saying whiskey because the whole drug thing is a myth. I mean, if you looked at the FBI's homicide list last year, 23.9% of all homicides was happened, committed by people who had nothing in their body but whiskey, and 9.2% of all homicides happened with people that had nothing in their body but hard drugs. So the chances of us being murdered in America is two to one, whoever do it was, high, was drunk on whiskey. So this whole game they play, I mean, even this, this whole cop thing, this whole war. Last year, it's hard to believe if you listen to what we hear that not one cop was killed in New York City last year. It's hard to believe that all the way across this country last year, 67 cops was killed. 
that's down from the 70s when we averaged 120 cops killed every day. Last year, out of the 67 cops was killed, 48 of them was killed with small guns. We had more cops killed in America last year from knife wounds and fists than we had from double barrel shotguns. So when you sit and you look at this whole myth somewhere, you have to separate it out and say, okay, what's the number one problem in the black community today? It's whiskey, not dope. That's what my grandpa drank. That's what my grandma drank. That's what my cousins drank. That's what my mama drank. And we, 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 we creating a whole issue and letting everybody get around the main issue. More black women get raped and get whooped because the dude was drunk on whiskey, not high on coke. And we totally letting that go by. Why? Because America's letting it go by. Don't let that have to change. We're going to have to change our priorities. And that's the big problem. Get up in the morning in the black neighborhood on Sunday morning, put on a $300 outfit, $31,000 worth of jewelry, get in a $27,000 car and drive to that black church and give $5. And wonder why you get mugged. But when the rappers come to town, not Dorothy Hike, she get a crowd cause it's free. Hers is about love. When the rappers come to town, that same Miss Priority can find $40 for a child to buy a ticket, $25 for a t-shirt, and $15 for a silly glove. But you never gave that child or yourself gave $10 to the NAACP or the Urban League, or SCLC, or to this sister over here, or to Calvin Roloff. That's what the whole game is. And it's just a matter of changing priorities. So when the brother asked me, well, we're making progress, I, you know, progress? I, I didn't even want to deal with it. Tell me about progress. It used to be called Negro History Week, now it's called Black Month. Progress, of course, wouldn't you know when they get ready to give us a month? Be that month of February and all them days missing. <laughs> That's what I mean. That's me. See, we got to start picking out our month. Now, I didn't expect them to give us the 31 day, but I was stunned when they laid February on it. <laughs> Most African American blacks I know, not only do we not like February, don't even understand what's a groundhog. <laughs> You know y'all owe me a meal. I came in, I told y'all I'm on a very special diet and I told y'all what I wanted. And y'all come up here with some ham, I told y'all I wanted quail. I wanted to see me some quail on my plate. They talk about he out the country. But think about Groundhog Day. That's why we got to even come up with our own calendar and change y'all. What's a groundhog? On February the 2nd, if the groundhog sees his shadow, six more weeks of winter. Now tell that to somebody living in San Diego. <laughs> I'm not born with homicidal genes, man. I'm 59 years old. I got 10 black children. And I've been black all my life. We don't have homicidal genes. Matter of fact, to be honest, white folk commit more violence every day in America than black folks. They just do theirs in the house. I do mine on the street corner. And if you don't believe it, look at the stats. Go to the Vietnam Wall of Respect. Count all the names on it. You get almost 50,000. Make another wall next to that and put all the children in America in the last 25 years that's been killed from child abuse and child neglect and the wall be twice the size and 91% of them be white folks, okay? Beat their children to death. That violence, what they're doing to wives, battered wives, I mean, that whole thing. But it happens in the house. And so consequently, maybe for, for the first time, we can move this to a different level and do it without insulting the black woman. I'm so tired of hearing that ain't no black man at home. Well, why y'all tell me about Frederick Douglass? He didn't have no daddy. Why y'all tell me about Du Bois? He didn't have no daddy. Hitler had a father. <laughs> okay. Jack the Ripper had a father. The only president ever been ran out of the White House, Dick Nixon had a father at home, and you can't get no closer family ties than the mafioso. Them Italians talk about family, and they reduced the whole world down to animals. 
So we keep throwing this back on us, and you haven't proved that it works someplace else. Look what them Nazis did. Now you tell me they came out of broken homes? And so look at the folks who invented the nuclear bomb. Look at the folks who's messed up the ecology. It's not fourth grade dropout black folks with no daddies at home. These are well-groomed, well-educated, scientific white minds that then polluted the whole world. So somebody better really go easy when you start talking about no black man at home and make sure you don't insult my black sister, who is my wife, who is my daughter, who is my mother. And let's put this blame where it belongs. My father's father. My grandfather died 1917. You know when his wife died? 1972. Here's a man, married to a woman. He died 1917, she died 1972. We've been endangered, man. It's a white racist system that destroys us. And when we sit around and talk, we kind of talk about everything but a racist system. You see, my biggest problem in this system is it's a white racist system and I have a sexist mentality. Now, why is that detrimental? Because a sexist mentality tells me all these false things and I'm supposed to protect the woman. She can't survive without me. I'm supposed to bring the money home. And then a white racist system stops me from doing that. And instead of me, because the whole thing is false in the first place, but instead of me reacting to the system, I tear up me. I overdrink, I overdance, I overplay football. I mean, no way we should be the athletes that we are. We overdo it. And so consequently, when we stop and look and say, look, I'm not going to overdo nothing else no more. If I'm going to overdo a thing, I'm going to overdo the system. Remember. I'm 59 years old. The reason I lived this long because black women protected us from black men that came home from work mad at white folks that weren't going to do nothing and talk about what they weren't going to take off their sons. They always jumped on us. Boy, I'll kill you. I'll take this off. He wasn't mad at me. He mad at a system that reduced him down to a boy every day. And white folks wonder why niggas can't get to work on time. The longer it takes me to get to work, the longer I keep my manhood, and the earlier I can get off, the faster I get it back. That's what that is, man. I mean, don't nobody. White folks don't get up as early as black folks and don't stay up as late as we do, so don't act like I can get out of bed. But it's that whole humiliation, that whole insult. Once we get past that, then we can start changing the thing around. And maybe Elijah Muhammad and the Muslims, maybe somebody need to go in the black community and say, now, is this a myth or is it real? How many black Muslims don't go to jail? Now, I'm not talking about the ones that's in jail that convert to being black Muslims. How many of you black Muslims who don't have a job, who's locked into poverty, but when I see you, you're still neat, you're still clean, you got them strange looking little haircuts, and, and all y'all look like y'all been to college, and I know y'all haven't. Now, what happened to you all? You didn't go to Harvard, you didn't go to MIT, you didn't go to Howard. There's an attitude change. You not only don't do dope. I mean, in my Christian friends, man, not, I mean, if one of them gets off dope, they'll sit around and laugh and thank God, and they're still drinking bourbon, smoking cigarettes, and drinking coffee. Here's a man came through and took him off a of hard dope, soft dope, all drugs, all wine, all cigarettes, all everything, and one day we better open up our eyes and say, did he have the answer? He didn't just say no to dope. He said no to dope and yes to God, then rearranged the diet. We got a Malcolm X. I'm not talking about something that some white folks told me. I'm talking about something that happened in our neighborhood during our lifetime. Malcolm X, a hoodlum, a thug, a dope pusher, a drug addict, a gangster. When Malcolm left this planet, he left one of the finest, most honorable, decent, ethical human beings that ever lived. What happened? The highest suicide rate among adults in America is black folks. Y'all know that, right? Let me see your hand. Y'all ready for this? 93% of all black adult suicides went to white colleges. <laughs> <laughs> what a hell of an indictment. <laughs> of Harvard, MIT, I was at MIT last year, they said, you'll never come back here again. Ah, oh, you told me that last time I was <laughs> The Massachusetts Institute of Technology, they got upset because I referred to them as an illegitimate trade school. <laughs> Harvard and MIT have more suicides in one year than all the Big Ten schools have in 20, and we want to walk around with a white value system talking about those are good schools. They are cesspools of filth. What do you do in raping the mind that young high school children with good minds and one of us can get there? Blow their brains out. Somewhere. It didn't just start. If you would have cared a long time ago, concerned black folks have been trying to tell y'all, didn't just start happening this year, last year. 
Everybody upset about black teenage pregnancies. It's always been going on. Y'all act like that no teenager ever had a, a child until Bill Moyer told you about it. <laughs> and what he didn't tell you is white teenage pregnancy in America is 10 times higher than black teenage pregnancy. Koreans can come here and they can get off the boat and they can put 50 to a room. They can work seven days a week. Uh, the day that this woman is off, she takes care of all the children and they bring all the money and they put it in one little pool. Well, I'm sure we would act the same way if we was in a foreign country. See, when you go to a foreign country, you're scared. You tend to trust people that you wouldn't trust ordinarily. We're not in a foreign country, man. And so what I'm saying is, is when you look at our lifestyle, compared to people coming in from Asia or, or, or Mexico, there's no comparison. When you look at, at us compared to Jews, I mean, I mean you, you can look at us compared to light-complected black folks. Light-complected black folks can fare better than dark-complected black folks in a system that have less effect on them. In other, words, in other words, I walk down the street 12 miles away, they can look through binoculars and see me coming. You know, my light-complected cousin, they can't. So the lighter complex, and one day we're gonna have to go to the jails and say, how many light-complected folks is in jail compared to dark-complected folks? Then somebody say, wait, wait a minute, now. there's more dark-complected black folks than light-complected. Okay, now, how many light-complected folks is in the professions, in the business, in the entrepreneurship compared to dark-complected folks? Then, then it don't balance out. Because the less humiliation I have, the lighter I am, the less humiliation I have. And it works, man. I mean, is it, is it kind of strange that, that in New Orleans there's, there, there's never been a mayor elected that was dark? And I don't know if there could be one. Do we, in our crazy madness, emulate white folks? And if I can't, if I, if I can't do it, give me as close as I can. And you know, we African Americans don't do anything else. We need to pool our money together and just quickly open us up some black greeting card companies. I mean, now, I'm not saying that Hallmark don't know how to make a pretty card. There's nobody on the planet can make a prettier card than Hallmark. I mean, Hallmark got their game together. Their cards are so beautiful. Last year, I walked down to Hallmark Rack and bought a Mother's Day card. My mother been dead 42 years. <laughs> but when you open up the Hallmark card, they do not know how to capture that ghetto vibration. The crow dark sings as sweetly as the lark when neither are tender. Nigga, do you love me or not? <laughs> we just need some simple cards with some simple messages. I ain't gonna do it no more. <laughs> Give me another chance, baby. I know what you're thinking, but she hit on me first. <laughs> and we got to work this thing out. And we got to start learning some things that people was born knowing that money is not power. Education is not power. Information is power. And that's what's so good. We got the educators in and, and the researchers in, and out of this comes information. I heard someone say today, they were right. We don't need just to come out of this. We need to discuss that the number one killer of black males, 17 to 24, is, is homicide, but we need to know why. I've been black 59 years. I have 10 children, married to a black woman 32 years, and I know we're not born with homicidal genes, so what make me do this? That's where the, the, the new level have to go. Now, I'll be honest now, I'm, I'm dealing with the surface stuff. Every time I get around young black dudes, I ask them, how old are they? They say 17 to 24, I get to get them because I know they're on their way to kill somebody. <laughs> <laughs> and I ask everybody questions. I have a nutrition company, I got a lot of white folks work for me. I ask them questions and I invite them to ask me questions. I ask them white folks some questions this morning in my office. Why is it when I was born, I was black? When I grew up, I was black. When I get sick, I'm black. I lay in the sun all week, I'm black. When I die, I'm black. Now look at you, white folks. You're born pink. You grow up, you're white. You get sick, you green. You lay in the sun all day, you red. You get out in the cold winter time, you turn blue. When you die, you turn purple. And y'all won't call me color. <laughs> the real nigga in America ain't me, it ain't my mama, ain't my sister, the white woman. And yet, and still, she don't know that. She still walk down the street like she's something precious. Here's a white woman came over on the boat the same time this white boy did, but she didn't get the right to vote to 1920, and she don't see nothing wrong with that. 
A white woman in America today, 1991, with a doctor's degree, make 56% less than a white male that dropped out of high school? And she don't see nothing wrong with that? ERA got voted down, and when ERA got voted down, not one black state legislator across this country that was white men? Now, I mean, I can drop this white boy out my belly, I can be his mama, his brother, his sister, and he have no more respect for me than that, and she don't know what bind she's in? Well, baby, if she ever wake up, the reason that civil rights bill is being held up now, not because of me. You got to listen to white folks. They talking codes because that white woman. Boy, if that thing get through the way it's going to get through, they will really free her. And that's what they're talking about. It ain't me. It's the white lady that messed up my bill. So I wish she'd come on out here and get out here and find who she is. And we'd turn this whole thing around. But the whole level is changing. And for the first time, you know, we might get pure. It's very difficult to do without the church. You know how nasty the church is, man? You know what I mean? Drunks come out to church. These folks out here that we see out here drugging and in the mafia, you know, they, they come out to Christian church, man. So one day we're going to really deal and stop the church and say, wait a minute, I mean, maybe you'd be best to close down. Look what you're producing. Them soldiers that run all over the world killing folks, they come out to church, man. I mean, but they don't want to talk about racism. They don't want to talk about sexism. They don't want to talk about none of that craziness. And yet and still, they opened up and they talk about what influence. And so it's a hell of a job to try to change a whole nation when the church is not changing. That's a hell of a job. And somewhere, you know, we're trying to do it. And it will work because we have a lot of influence. And see, one day when we black folks understand how much influence we have on white folks, if you go all over the world and go to every country where there are no black folks, you find the whitest white folks. I mean, I go to Germany, ain't no niggas in Germany. Them, them Germans is so white. I go to Russia, them Russians is so white. I go to England, them Englishes is so white. Only where there are black folks, heavily populated, white folk get dark. They laying out in the sun trying to look like me. That's the influence I have on them. And I keep asking myself, how come Russians don't lay in the sun? They got sun over there. How come Germans don't lay in the sun? They got sun over there. Wherever I'm not around, I do not influence white folks' color, wherever I am around. Now, one day when I understand how good I look being this color to make everybody else want to look like me, but the mindset, and once that's changed, well, oh, peace change. Y'all got to stop being super niggas. Yeah. <laughs> Just because somebody going to like you. Yeah. They don't care nothing about you. They asked me, he said, look here, you got your daughter over there that want to get this for the news, uh, uh, you know, this, uh, I just got back from Africa with Roland, my sister Dorothy. Yeah. Hell of a trip. That's right. Brothers and sisters meeting brothers and sisters, and we stayed there just long enough not to mess up, because we went over there with a white racist mentality, with a black face, meeting some face with a black face, with a white colonial mentality, we didn't stay long enough for a declash. <laughs> So I just got back. I didn't know about some white boy over there at Georgetown Law School that found some Tesco. Y'all know about it, right? Right, right, right. Yeah. And asked me what did I think. Like, I don't want to talk about it. Tell me about them niggas in Georgetown that play basketball. Some of them niggas can't even read. And y'all don't want to talk about that. Tell me about them niggas out there in Minnesota that raped that white girl, but the niggas played such good basketball, they put the white girl out of school for a report. <laughs> Tell me about all them old rich white folks, them dynasties that been giving so much money to Harvard and Yale. Don't care how dumb they children are, they're going to Harvard and they're going to graduate. What the hell y'all talking about? <laughs> and that's one of the things that we're going to have to start looking through and stop apologizing for all this filth. Long as you're a black athlete, long as a nigga can outrun Jesus with a football. They don't care nothing about your grade and will fire white instructors if they mess with them. <laughs> what embarrasses me more than ghetto niggas killing and selling dope is that a Georgetown University or Notre Dame can, can recruit better niggas to play basketball than a black college kid. That's what bothers me. Are you University? All these black you mean you can't get five black brothers? As long as them black colleges been out there for me, love me, not America, but the whole world wouldn't be the same if it wasn't for them black colleges. And if you don't believe it, if you don't believe it, you write down in the quietness of your mind, 100 the most important African-Americans that have made it world-renowned and 
98 of them be a product of black college. We got to start talking about our brilliant black minds. That's right. There's a whole lot of white folks that don't believe. Let me tell you, y'all ain't got no, y'all ain't got no, no choice but to change this thing in the ghetto. Cause the real white folks who don't know y'all, y'all walk down the street today in the white neighborhood. If you walk down dressed like y'all dressed, they say, "Don't push it." <coughs> if you walk down with your shirt open and snot running down your nose, cause you just hit a tree trying to dodge the miss hitting a white child that ran out in the street, they see you and say, "Don't have no bad." It's getting to the point that with all this negative stuff coming out, because if you listen to the news, you think drugs run from the ghetto to Columbia. <laughs> and we're so busy talking about these little black boys, and I'm so damn sick and tired of these folks interviewing me on these shows saying, well, well I said somebody, a white woman asked me yesterday, said, uh, 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 Doug Wilder, how do you feel about him? I said, oh, I love the brother. Matter of fact, if I had my way, he wouldn't have to run for president. I'd just put him in the White House. <laughs> And she looked at me and she says, then you think he's the best qualified black? For oh, I didn't know you was talking about black. Oh, no, my cousin, best qualified black. <laughs> Jabbo Jones, that nigga dead. He the best qualified black. I thought you was talking about everybody. That's what I thought you was talking about. But you just talking about niggas, my cousin. <laughs> and he dead. what happened in, in Cleveland and, and Jesse didn't get invited. Why? Because they can always find room all my life for them racist thugs out the South that's in the Democratic Party. They always find room for them and we shouldn't tolerate that. And don't be so busy trying to save a group of black men that you think gonna die that you don't protect the living. Don't let them not forgive and pass all the laws just to save them drug addicts and miss my sister over here that got masterful programs. That miss my black institution that got masterful programs. Don't let nobody get you locked into this negative syndrome. Don't walk in nobody's office 24 hours and they're so busy talking about black men that's on their way out, they forget to see you sitting there with these five books you wrote. And that's, we got to be in charge of our destiny. We got to change these priorities. We got to decide what's going to be on the conscience of black folks' mind. And one day in the not too distant future, we're going to have to look over there at that whole gladiator thing and shut it down. We're going to have to say to black families, no longer can we produce black gladiators for white races. No way. no way can we look at the, the final four and, and look at the basketball now and I see that. I see slavery all over again. Niggas in the field doing the serious work. White boys sitting on the bench with a clipboard trying to look intelligent. 